Today's going to be interesting because I'm just, I'm just going to be processing with you guys about a word that I really feel the Lord's been putting on my heart for the last, I'd say, a couple months. Um, by the way, if you're wondering where everyone is, Pastor Tim and a team of Olive and some other individuals are down in New Orleans ministering at Apostle Willie Wooten's church, uh, Gideon Christian Fellowship International. So they'll be back later this evening, I believe. Um, John told me he's going to make sure as he breaks his fast to stop and get all the boudin he can um, and to bring it back to the promised land. So that's where everybody, uh, most people are this morning, and so we, we're praying for them. I hear at this time they're probably just finishing their first of five sets of worship uh, from what I hear. <laughs> uh, anyway, yes. So this, this morning, I just want to kind of talk to you a little bit about what the Lord's been really putting in my heart. Uh, I've been ruminating on this. Uh, if I titled this, I'd, I'd title this message as the, the Call to Priesthood, um, Holiness and Consecration. And so this has just been a message that the Lord's been putting on my heart. In fact, if you ask me, what are the big messages I think the church needs to really get in their DNA? Like, what is their understanding? I tell you, spiritual warfare, right? And the priesthood. Okay, these are the two things that the Lord has really been putting on me in this season. One, spiritual warfare. You don't, if you don't understand what's going on, your life is going to be a wreck and you're not going to know why. Okay? How many of you know you live in a war? You were born into a war. Okay? The minute you were born into this kingdom. And the other one is this priesthood message, which goes in tandem with the spiritual warfare message. And, uh, and we may get into that today. You know, Amazon's a dangerous thing. Uh, the Lord starts speaking to me about a topic, and the next thing I know, I have eight books on the priesthood coming to my house. Uh, because you, they have that option. It's just buy with one click. And it's like, well, it's just a click, you know? How, how much can it hurt? Um, a lot. It can hurt your pocketbook a lot, right? Um, but I really do feel like the Lord is putting such a message of holiness, purity, and consecration in me for the church and, you know, when I say that, uh, being a youth pastor, a lot of times people are like, oh, sexual purity. Look, that's like the low end, right? That's the obvious end. That's, that's, that's like, like, look, this is the milk, right? When I talk about holiness, purity, and consecration, I'm not talking about things you don't need to do. Or I'm, I'm talking about it's unto something, like, we don't just clean, like, get clean and holy and pure and let the Lord wash us and cleanse us just so we can be, but it's actually unto something greater. It's unto being the priesthood that God has called us to be, okay? And right now, there's this thing that uh, is really on me. I keep going back to Nehemiah chapter 13, and in this, this weird scenario where Nehemiah has been doing all this work to get Jerusalem rebuilt, the wall rebuilt, the temple, and everything operational and in order. And he goes away, he comes back, and he finds that the priest, Eliashib, has let the very enemy of the Lord who has been against him since the beginning, been against them rebuilding the city, been against them building the walls, Tobiah, he literally lets Tobiah come and have a room in the temple. And it says this in Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 4. It says, now before this, Eliashib, the priest who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by the commandment to the Levite singers and gatekeepers and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. So, yeah, it's like, where are you going with that, right? Let me tell you, this. we know this, that we are the temple of the Lord, Right? We are the house of God. And there are some times that we let the very enemy of God stay here, stay in us rent-free. It's, it's a spirit of compromise. 
right? It's a spirit of compromise where we let the enemy stay in there and we're like, well, you know, he's a relative and, you know, he's, he's helping us and we like him. You know what room he was staying in? The one that had the tithes, the offerings, the frankincense, okay, all of the things, many of which were actually appointed for the Levite priests and the enemy's coming in there and he's actually taking what you are rightfully due. And we don't even realize it. We're hurting ourselves because we're allowing Tobiah to stay in this place. Now, I don't want to come off on a harsh tone today and so I'm going to stop and swerve. But I just want you to understand that we're, this is a serious thing that we're, we're talking about. And, I, you know, anytime the Lord speaks to me on a topic, it feels like it's the most urgent topic there is. Uh, and so I'm gonna, I might come out with a sense of urgency. But I want to go and, and, and lay the foundation in, in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. I want to start there because I think this is going to help us understand this thing about holiness. And then, and then I'm going to share a personal story with you where the Lord rebuked me because that's always encouraging. It's encouraging to you, right? Because you're like, oh, okay, the Lord gets mad at other people too. And he disciplines them, I should say. Um, verse 15, it says this. It says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Notice that Paul is writing this, or Peter is writing this, excuse me, to believers. He's not writing this to pagans. He's not writing this to people who aren't part of the community of God. And he's actually saying, you need to be holy. You need to be holy. Be holy. So guess what they probably weren't being? <laughs> holy. Okay, this mentality that says, I walk into the kingdom of God and all of a sudden I'm perfect is what we call a doctrine of demons in this house. And I'm just going to say it because it will leave you in a place that you can never advance forward because you don't know that you have a Tobiah that is living in you that God wants to cleanse and remove. Okay? Yes, you are sanctified, but guess what? You are being sanctified, okay? There are levels, and we're going to talk about this today because this is where we're heading. I know that the Lord is saying, I want to do something in my church, but my church is not ready right now to hold what I want to do. There has to be foundations laid. There have to be things cleaned and we have to understand that we don't just gather and come to church and, and we come to the body and that's it. Because guys, it's unto something. It's unto being a stewardess or stewards of the very holy presence of God. That's what it means to be a priest, right? And so that's what we're going to just unpack a little bit today. You know, a couple months ago, the way that the Lord start, started me on this whole process... I was driving down 49, and uh, there was just a lot of traffic, and there were some cars driving like maniacs, which is a normal day in Shreveport. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I have this thought. I say to myself, and I say, look at all these people. We're all the same, just in this rat race. And the Lord, I mean, not like harshly, but you know when like someone like corrects you? He said, that is the mentality that my church has, and it's why they're ineffective. And I'm telling you, it hit me, and, you know, the Lord speaks to me in a lot of knowings. It's, you know, I don't, I don't hear this voice in my car. I literally all of a sudden am overwhelmed with this knowing of how wrong I am. <laughs> and, and in this, he starts to develop and unravel this understanding of holiness, purity, and consecration. And essentially what he says is he says, the fact that you view yourself as the same as the world is the reason my church can't make any change in this nation. The essence of the church, one of the characteristic essence of this church is it is holy. Holy means set apart at some level. I mean, it's a very watered down version. It means so much more than that. It means set apart, completely distinct. 
You have been called out of the world. You've been called and transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And when we start comparing ourselves to the world, we're actually removing the very essence and characteristic of what makes us the church set apart. It's not until you realize that you are completely different and distinct from the world that you can actually step into that and say, hey, this is actually what I'm called to be. And the church that is trying to toe that line between the world and God's kingdom and walk that trapeze balance is actually removing the most attractive thing about the church, which it is, which is it isn't the world. The most attractive thing about the church is it's not the world. It's wholly distinct. And this seeker friendly that tries to like, you know, mix in everything, it is diluting. It is allowing Tobias to come in. It is actually removing the very characteristics and essence of what God created the church to be. Completely distinct and set apart. That's an attractive thing to the world. Because the last thing that an unbeliever wants to do is come into the church and see the world. Because what do they say? They say, I, I have this out where I'm at, and it's more fun. Okay? They don't want to see the world. They want to see, a, they want to see a call to a higher standard. Can I be honest with you? Sometimes we want to lower the standard, and we want to say, hey, everybody can make it because we're going to lower the standard. People want to see a call to a higher standard. I'm not talking about legalism here. I'm talking about spurring one another on to do good, holy works, to walk closer to the Lord, not saying, hey, you're wearing jeans. That's not very nice. Or, hey, you need to have your hair up in a bun. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about intimacy with the Lord. Okay? But we need to have that watermark a little higher than the rest of the world. That's the reality is when we look like the world, we are taking away everything that makes us unique and that set apart. And we are allowing all the Tobias to come in and dwell with us. And we're saying this is holy. And the Lord is saying that's called defilement. So good. It's going to be a nice message today. <laughs> um, holiness is an interesting word. Uh, like I was mentioning, it, it has no, there's no scripture reference in the Bible that actually explains what holiness is. In fact, it's, it's a very unique word in the sense of there is no description of it. <laughs> you just know that when you're in the presence of it, certain things happen and certain things don't happen, right? And the reason is, and this is fascinating, is because holy is the essence of what and who God is. And so just like we're not going to make an image or an idol in his image, we're not going to define a term either because you can't. It's limited in scope. So when we say that God is holy, what we're saying is he is completely unique and set apart from everything else in this world. Right? The only holiness that exists in all of creation is God. And when something is holy, it is that way because God has transferred and imparted some of his holiness onto that thing. When you get into the temple, you see you have these instruments of holiness. Why? Because they've been in the very Shekinah glory presence of God and that his presence has infused them with holiness. So holiness is a fascinating thing. You only get it from God. Whether it's a person, a place, or a thing, you know, because there are holy places, and they're not holy places like pagan religions say, like, hey, we go to this place because it's holy. It's holy because God's presence is there. That's why Paul views the church as a sacred space. You don't, like, we don't understand that the church is his temple, and he's using this language because he's saying, what, is, what happens in the temple? God inhabits the temple. <clears throat> And all of a sudden we read his letters and we're like, why is Paul so mean? He's kicking these people out. But there's a reason because he protects the sanctity of the sacred space. It's holy. You don't understand that. He's like, get him out. Get the immoral brother out. He is polluting and defiling the holy space. It's not because he's mad at this. I mean, he's upset. He wants him to walk in a holy life. Don't get me wrong. But we have that individualistic mentality that makes it about us. And Paul's saying it's about the community. 
He's defiling the community. And in doing so, he's defiling your whole presence. Do you know that other people's issues and other people's sins affect us when we gather as a body? This isn't to condemn you. It's to bring the reality that when God says you're a holy nation, it's a corporate identity. It's a corporate identity. And so holiness is a fascinating thing. You have instruments that are holy. You have, like I said, when God shows up, a place becomes holy. Don't take your shoes off because this is holy ground. And so it's just this complete, utterly distinct, top-level status. And when God says, you are holy, what he's saying is, I'm going to put my very essence on you. You get to partake of that divine nature, right, is what Peter says. You get to, to take a, partake of my divine nature, become holy like me, but understand it is not you, but it's me in you. And then we want to let anything and everything run rampant in our lives or in the church, not understanding the very invitation God has given us to dwell with us. You understand holiness, consecration, and purity is for the purpose of God dwelling in our midst dwelling in our lives. It's not so that we can say I'm better than you because I don't smoke a cigarette. That's not what it is. It's literally saying, no, I am pursuing him, which means as I come closer, there become these requirements in degrees of consecration in my life that says, if I want to push forward, I have to let some things go behind me. It's what Rondi was giving me today. If you want to push forward into God, then you're going to have to let things fall off you and stay behind you. It's just the reality of the priestly call. We are all in this process, and that's what we've been talking about when we talk about faith. We, we, one thing we can talk about in this house is how to walk out your prophetic words. All right? We do it well because we've all experienced it. And I will say this. Our view, and it's true, has always been when you walk out the word of God in your life with humility and trembling and surrender, it will bring you to a cross. It will bring you to deliverance. It will bring you to purification. It will bring you to consecration. It will bring you to those things. Why? Because as you walk it out, you're drawing closer to him. But there's also something where I am my brother's keeper, and if I'm in the house and I feel and see that someone's struggling with something, and I'm not going to go there in an accusatory way, but I say, hey, can I help speed up the process in your life? Can we deal with this? Is this an issue we can deal with, right? People don't like that. People, I don't like that. And here's the thing, it's not to say that you have to be perfect to be in this house, but man, you should be walking in that direction. Yeah. I don't want to put any legally binding sense of I have to do, I have to, it's not about you performing, and that's what we'll see in a minute. It's actually just about you drawing near to the Lord. It's about you drawing near to the Lord. People don't understand this. There's this, this passage, and in, in, it's in the Bible, but I like to read it. Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, because it reveals an aspect of the heart of God that sometimes people are like, wait, God, that's God? I'm like, yes, isn't he loving and kind and compassionate? It says this, and understand, when, we read, when I read these verses, think of the trajectory. Think of the trajectory. What's the direction? Come. Let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out as sure as the dawn, he will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains the water and waters the earth. There's this trajectory towards saying, God, I want to know you. And as we walk that out, guess what happens? He stands in front of us. He holds a sword. He says, yeah, come on, walk this way. 
And you literally have to walk through the sword as you come to him, and it hurts. And you're like, what's going on? He's like, I'm cutting you, but trust me, this is going to heal you. He breaks us, but what's the purpose? To bind us up. Man, I'm telling you, if you haven't walked in your life with the Lord and been broken by him, then you're not really pursuing him. You're not walking forward because the whole trajectory and direction of those verses is return, come, stand before him. Come, let you know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. Gosh, when we're talking about holiness and consecration, it is about him. It's about knowing him. It's about coming close to him. It is not about you. Guys, we are filthy in our righteousness. We are filthy rags. But in his sovereign goodness and grace, he says, I'm going to bestow upon you the essence of my glory, my holiness. And it's an invitation to draw closer. But know this, as you draw closer, you're going to be cut. You're going to be broken. But there's a greater thing that's happening because you will be able to live before me. You'll be able to live before me and not be some defiled church. Because I'm, I'm, I'm talking about my own life, okay? With the things I've tolerated in my life that aren't the Lord. Trust me, I'm not telling you anything that I'm not going through myself, in terms of holiness and purity. I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Because as we're saying, you know, the holiness, the consecration, the purity, they're not, they're not ends in themselves, but they're means unto something greater. And the reality is that is the priestly mandate and call. Because you've got to be tough. I'm telling you, <laughs> Christianity isn't for the weak of heart. I'm just, I'm just being honest. Those people who had you say a prayer and tricked you into being saved, they just gave you, they just gave you half the message. I'm just telling you, it is not for the weak of heart. It is not because there are moments where you are literally confronted with the ugly reality in your heart. Or the things that you're holding on to that literally the Lord has to come and break you so you let them go. I mean, this is how he operates, and it's, it's a loving, so loving and gracious and merciful of him. I mean, he really is such a good father. I've learned this having kids. Not disciplining your kids is because you don't love them as you should love them. <laughs> Disciplining is tough, but it is true. It is the true manifestation of love because you say I you tell your kid I can't let you stay the way you are okay because there's something greater so I want to go to first Peter chapter 2 verse 9 and, and we're going to camp here for a minute but it says this this is again this is Peter talking to the church it says but you that's a plural you Y'all, in the Louisiana translation, are a chosen race. So we're chosen by him. When he chooses you, it separates you from those who haven't been chosen. <laughs> in other words, when he chooses you, and again, the way that you get cho chosen by the Lord is when he says, hey, I want you, you say yes. Yes. That's how you get chosen. Everyone has the invitation. But when he chooses you, he pulls you on his team, and you're not on the other team. We have immediately right there, you, there is a separation, a distinction. Again, whispers of what holiness is. There's no clear definition, but being chosen is actually part of being holy. So when you are chosen... You're set apart and you become on God's team. He chooses you to be with him. He separates you from everything else. But you were chosen a royal priesthood. Man, after I read these eight books, I'll teach more about what the priesthood is. If I'm lucky, I'll read three of them and the others will make it on my bookshelf. A royal priesthood. Guys, this is, it's, it's being set apart 
for a godly purpose is what a priesthood means. You, you don't just minister to yourself. You minister unto God, to him, for him. That's what the priesthood means. You stand in the gap between God and the world. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Again, he doesn't say a holy person. You are. But God views us in a corporate identity as well. You want to know how God's a corporate God? I'll give you an example that I don't like. Remember when the spies went to Israel, to Canaan, and, and scoped out the land? There's 12 of them, right? Can y'all name the other 10? I'd be impressed. If you could, I'd say you're focusing on the wrong thing. Uh, <laughs> 10 come back with a bad report, right? But two, Joshua and Caleb, we can name them. Come back saying, let's do it. Let's take the land. The Lord will go before us. It's ripe for the taking. We can do this, right? They literally are, they have pressed on to know the Lord, and they know him, and they're reporting based off of what they know of God and what he's called them to do, right? Here's, here's why this is important to press on and know the Lord. You can either become one of the ten or one of the two. When you know the Lord, then you'll come back with the same report as Caleb and Joshua. If you don't know the Lord and you don't press on and you don't let him do those things in your life, regardless of what you think right now in this moment, you'll say, you'll be one of the ten. So Joshua and Caleb come back. They're giving the answer of the Lord. And God gets mad. And guess what happens? They all suffer. And even Joshua and Caleb have to wander for 40 years in the desert. The flip side is they get to enter the promised land. But they still have to endure the cleansing and the purging and the consecrating that the entire community endure for 40 years. God is a God of community. When he says a holy nation, it's saying you together are separate, set apart for my service it's a corporate identity. It's, it is something that has to be pursued and walked out. Again, it's why Paul says, get the immoral brethren out from among you. I'm not saying that we're going to do that right now. But what I'm saying is you see Paul has this urgency to preserve the sanctity of the sacred space, the temple, God's gathering body here on earth. This is I like James uh, Chapter 1, verse 27 says this about religion. He goes, religion that is pure is undefiled before God. The Father, uh, God the Father. Um, it's also this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It's your duty. But man, the world is so enticing. Gosh, and with Netflix and all these streaming platforms, the world is at your fingertips tr knocking on the door to come into your house. And man, the Lord has been, <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm going through a process. The Lord has been so hammering me towards consecration. I mean, it's just, why do we find our entertainment from the things of the world? It's just, it's just, I'm guilty, right? But again, he's dealing with me on this. Look, you know, and during this fast, one thing I told Camille is I'm going to fast YouTube and, uh, and look, I, I'm an information guy. And when I watch YouTube, I'm not watching like random videos. I'm like watching like people teach. I'm watching messages. I'm watching, you know, seems like every one of God's people on YouTube is a prophet now. I'm watching, I'm, I'm, like I'm watching all this information and I'm just realizing that so much of it is just garbage. Why go get my information there when I can literally get it from the word of God? Okay, it's pure, it's unadulterated, it's, anyway, but there's been, there's been a shift, you know, the first day I did this, I block it on my phone, and, and then I give the password to my wife, so I can't put it in just to watch it, and so I realized the first day I picked up my phone 20 times, at least within an hour, just saying, oh, to open up YouTube, and I'm like, Ur, Ur. it took like four days to go through the withdrawals of YouTube, okay, okay. 
So if I'm not responding on social media, please just don't take it personal. It's a corporate thing. Um, <laughs> I love this. He says, he says this. He says, uh, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, right? A people for his own possession. So you start getting to the heart of it right here. All these other things about being chosen, royal priesthood, holy nation, are for this one thing, being his and being his possession. So if you ever think it's about you looking good, <laughs> if you ever think it's about you acting right, it's about him having you and him having all of you. It's about him. Don't make it about you. Holiness and consecration and purity are about him. Him having what he wants. All right. Um, you know, and, and when we get to scripture and we talk about holy, right, there's only two, two, two categories. It's holiness is always used when God appears, right, his presence, and it's used about the religious instruments in worship that are functioning in his presence. It's the only time. And so when he says you're a holy nation, what he's saying is you're called to live and move within my very presence. See, we don't understand this sometimes, but in the Old Testament, when God came to dwell with Israel and he came to dwell in that ark, <clears throat> the ark of the covenant, his literal manifest presence dwelt on the ark. It wasn't a metaphor. It wasn't symbolism. It was his literal, they call it the Shekinah glory of God, dwelt on that ark, on the mercy seat, the throne of grace between the two cherubim. It was a seat that he sat on. We don't understand this. There was a manifestation when Israel was in the wilderness, right? You either had a cloud or you had a pillar of fire. And everyone could look in the center and see that God was on his throne. When that, chat, when that ark shifts to be a, a solid temple building in the reign of Solomon, and I love it and, and when you see that God's glory fills the temple after they build it in Solomon. Again, it was a physical, like manifest presence of God's glory in the Holy of Holies. And that's why when you get to the Psalms, you have all these Psalms saying, come, let us go to the Mount of the Lord, right? The people longing to be in the house of God. Why? Because his presence was there. And as you got to the city of Jerusalem, right, the city of God, you know why Jerusalem is important? Because God's presence is there. Okay, God's presence was there in the Old Testament, and that's why it's important. It could have been anywhere else, but God chose Jerusalem, and so that's why you see even in the Psalms, it talks about desiring to be in Jerusalem, the city of God, because could you imagine walking on a pilgrimage and all of a sudden you keep walking and then all of a sudden the atmosphere starts shifting. You get lighter. The hairs on your back of your neck start standing up. And all of a sudden you're thinking good thoughts and good things. And you're like, what is going on? Because you are coming into the territory of the king, the domain of the king, his kingdom. And as you get closer to the Shekinah glory, things shift because things in his kingdom cannot be there. <clears throat> That's why people longed. Let me just be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord. Better is one day in your house, Lord, than a thousand elsewhere. There's that presence. We forget that. His literal presence dwelt there. It's what made people travel all the way from Africa to come before God. And as a church, we so, for lack of knowledge, perish because we don't understand that we are his holy sacred ground, his temple where he dwells within us. So, going, continuing on in First Peter, he says this, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him 
who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. If there's any passage to explain the nuances of holiness at some level for us, this is it. There is a possession where he says, you're mine, but there's a calling. And in, in this whole process, we proclaim his excellencies. We're like, come, come, you need to know my God. He's so good. Just come into his presence. Just come into his presence. Look, when I was, <clears throat> when I had just been saved, I, would, I took the, a trip to Columbia to this church, the one where we're going to, but I, the, they are a church of worship. And when you get there, the manifest tangible presence of God is profound and I remember there's no better there's no there's no word to describe it but I remember coming home and being in in the kitchen and you know my dad was asking me what was it like and I just didn't have words and I just remember hold up my Bible saying everything in here is real you can you just have to experience it and then you become like one of the disciples saying, look, just come, come, come. You got to meet them. Come, you got to meet them. It's the best form of evangelism. Look, just come and meet them. Right? You can listen to me, but so many people are trying to talk about God and they don't even know them. Okay? But there's this thing where we proclaim his excellencies and he has called us out of darkness and into light. That separation. And it's such an important thing for us to understand because I'm telling you, the Lord is beginning right now to unravel this thing about the, the priesthood. If you're in the church, guess what you are? A priest. A priest. And again, it's, it's that, we, I just can't say it enough. Holiness is unto something. It's for him. It's for him to be able to call us his own and to possess, possess us as his own. He longs for us. He longs to be with us. He longs for us to be his and to call us his. And guess what happens when sin and defilement comes into our life? Hebrews says, cast it off because it trips you up, right? So the priestly call... <clears throat> And holiness allows us to exist within the very intimate presence of God, right? That's just, that's just the reality of it. It allows us to exist within the very intimate presence of God. But there are requirements to be able to dwell within that close proximity to the Shekinah glory of God. The Old Testament really does a great job of showing this when it talks about the tabernacle system. You know, and I've, I, I love the tabernacle system. I talk about it all the time. But the tabernacle was the, the, the movable temple of God as they wandered through the wilderness. You know, you have to understand that as you pushed forward towards the very center of the tribes, the community, into the tabernacle, the requirements increased. The requirements increased. You know what the requirement, this, I was reading this, and this just, you know, a priest, if, if you're in the Israel, then you could go to the funeral of anyone, really. You know, if you're in the tribe of Israel, you could attend anyone's funeral. If you were a priest, you could only go to a funeral of your wife or very close relative. If you were the high priest, you could only attend the funeral of your wife, not even your parents, not even your children, just your wife. <laughs> the sacrifice and requirements. But why? Because guess what they had access to? The deeper places of God. The closer proximities. The holy priest was the one who stood before the very Shekinah glory once a year. But there were requirements. There were things that he had to surrender and let go of. I mean, to think that you, you're ministering as a high priest and one of your son dies, but you can't even attend the funeral because when you attend a funeral, you become unclean and your duty is so important that you can't be unclean because the people literally are depending on you, right? And as a church, we come and we don't even realize that it hasn't really shifted 
we still play a vital role in this world. But we allow ourselves to be defiled and be unclean and not be consecrated. I want to talk real quick. I want to read this one passage. I'm not going to go into it because I just don't have time today. But it's still an important passage because I'm just trying to hit home. What I'm trying to do is provoke in you a desire that says, God, I want to become my priest that you've called me to be. I want to be consecrated unto your service and your kingdom. <clears throat> it says this, talking, uh, starting in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 14 and read to chapter 7. It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Look, we're talking about that separation, right? That distinction. This is New Testament, Paul. <laughs> He, this, is, this is literally what, when he's talking to believers, this is the standard that he's setting right here. I will make my dwelling among them. Excuse me. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their mists and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And then he says this, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. You understand? <laughs> we get mad because it's like, well, he's talking out of the Old Testament. Paul is too. <laughs> he's talking out of the Old Testament saying, here's your promises. Here's your promises. <laughs> and he says, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. Well, I thought my spirit was perfect. What? I th Bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Do you understand that holiness is a process, right? We are walking towards it. You know what holiness is, that, that process of holiness? It's you becoming more God-like. Why? Because only God is holy. And as you walk out that holiness, you're becoming more made in the image of God. Remember, it's all about being conformed to his likeness and image. And you become more and more and more as you're walking out your priestly duty. You think that your priestly duty is just maybe coming to church on Sunday and teaching your kids about God. That's important. But it's actually your priestly duty is to approach him. And as you approach him, you conform more to his image and more to his likeness. And that is the duty of a priest. So you come before him and and you be changed and transformed by his holiness so that your holiness can be working towards completion. <clears throat> I'm telling you, when the church wakes up and grabs this and latches onto the responsibility it has as his priests, <laughs> you'll see a move of God like never before. I'm telling you. And I'm not talking, you know, holiness, Pentecostal, no TV. I'm not talking about those rigid things. I mean, they have these, they, they have a, a hint of truth to them, right? But when, what happens when God leaves the structure? Because it's all about his presence. See, when God leaves, your laws that help you exist within his holiness just become religion and they become bondage. Unless he's present, it's just religion, you understand that? Unless he's there, it's just dead works. But when he's there, it changes everything. And what would be a dead work without his presence becomes a life-giving boundary when he's present. If he's not there and I try to section myself off and close myself off, I'm living in a religious cocoon. 
I might as well just be in the world. But the minute he calls me to that and he says, Scott, I want you to do this and do this, there's life. And his presence makes it all worth it. You see, holiness is about his presence. It's about his possession. If he's not there, it's pointless. I'm trying to make such a clear distinction between religious works and presence-driven holiness and consecration. You know, I, uh, this, is, I have a, this is a side note. And the reason I think this is hand in hand with spiritual warfare. You know, when in the New Testament, when Jesus casts out a spirit, what does he call the spirit? Unclean. Where does that word unclean come from? Someone who violates the law that was put in place for a holy God to exist among the sinful people. When you violate the law of God, and I'm not talking the 600 plus commandments, I'm talking about the law of the Spirit for us believers. But there is a boundary there. The, one of the purposes of the law was to create distance between you and the world so that the spiritual, demonic entities of the world wouldn't pollute and defile you. That's why there was such a separating from, this is what the pagans do, you won't do it. Because it invites a spiritual reality that's going to defile you. And so when Jesus cast out demons, it was an unclean spirit. Because it came in from someone not following a requirement and being a people of God's own presence. <clears throat> Look, there's sometimes when you do deliverance, it's there because there's a door open, and we say we, we use a nice word, there's a door open of sin, anger, whatever. It's just unclean. It's a violation of the law of God. And we have to understand that as we walk out that. And Jesus says, I didn't come to do away with the law, but I fulfilled it. But as we walk out and conform to the life of Christ, there's a cleansing and a purifying that happens in us and protects us from these things. I'm going to read these real quick. Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for, strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Thessalonians 4, 7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Yeah, this is all throughout the New Testament. All different writers in the New Testament. They are, there's a call for holiness. <clears throat> And I just, real quick, I know I'm out of time, but the best way to understand this is, is the encampment of the tribes of Israel around the tabernacle. If we talk about it, in, in fact, I was looking at this morning, this is the best model of the tabernacle. Like, it was long, rectangular, it should be turned 90 degrees if you want to be accurate with the entrance being from the east, but for the most part, this is how they camped around the tabernacle. So God's presence would dwell where that drum cage is, the holy of holies. It'd be sectioned off. The only one who gets in there is the drummer, the high priest, right? Okay? Then all of a sudden, what's the difference Gabe's saying, right? Um, <laughs> so everything this way would be the inner court, the court the, or excuse me, would be the holy place. And then you have the courts, and then you have the tribes dwelling around the courts, as you got closer to the Holy of Holies, requirements increased. Only one person could go there one time a year. In the, in the actual tabernacle, where the showbread was, where the incense was, where the menorah, all this stuff. This right here, only the priests that ministered unto the Lord in that area could go in here. And then out here in, the, in, in, in what we'd call the courtyard where they have the altar, the brazen altar and the laver and all that. The, only the priest, a different family of priests, but only they could minister. And they said that actually if you were Levite, if they needed to, you could actually participate in helping with the sacrifices. Then around the tabernacle, the first tribe that camped all the way around were the Levites. You see it in Numbers chapter 1, I think verse 53. The Levites. And God says they need to camp there to be a buffer 
between the presence of God and the rest of Israel so that God's holy presence and his wrath doesn't break out against the people. Why? I say it all the time. Because the holiness of God is the most dangerous thing for sinful people. And what happens is as you come closer, then you better be cleansed, you better be consecrated, and you better be pure. Because if you're trying to come in here and minister, you are going to reap the wrath of God. Not because God gets angry at you, because his holiness will bring instant judgment on sin. That's, if you ever wonder why you read numbers in these books where all of a sudden someone does something wrong and a plague breaks out. They were playing with holy fire. You mishandle it and you're going to create a wildfire. And it will run through the camp. And that's why Aaron or whoever, one of the priests, had to run out with the incense and create a barrier between the holiness of God and the people. Think of it as like a, as like a holy barrier where he's like, okay, 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 okay. I got it. He's got to encircle it to stop the plague from breaking out. We don't think about these things. Stewarding and host, hosting God is not lightly done. His holiness makes it so challenging. Then after the Levites, because you know Levites were actually consecrated unto the Lord for service. So they are actually set apart even more so. And then of the Levites, the priests were ordained. And if you go read in Leviticus chapter 8, you know how they got ordained? There's a lot of things, but one of the favorite things, my thing, is they had to spend seven days before the intimate presence of God in the tent of meetings to be ordained as a priest. Why? The purging of that presence, the cleansing, and they become so acquainted with the glory and presence of God that they can actually operate in their priestly duties and say, that's not God, that is God, because I'm acquainted with that presence. So there's this preparation, right? And then certain families had to be consecrated at greater levels to come closer and closer. But then once you get past the Levites and you go to the regular tribes, you're Israel. So you are actually set apart. You are his called people. You're in the, the holy priest nation, right? But then on the fringes of the camp, you had all who are unclean and impure, and you had foreigners, and I ask myself this, how much of the church is settled with living on the fringes of God's camp because they're not willing to go through the process and the consecration that it takes to come closer and closer and closer? And let me tell you this, because I'm not talking about works, because in some of your minds, it's like, how, what does this look like? <laughs> you know what it looks like? It looks like you surrendering to him in his ways. Every area of your life, every area of your body, every area of your soul, every area of your spirit, and you say, God, where there's any impure thing in me, there's any defilement in me, there's anything in me, Lord, deal with it. Because I long to come and approach your presence. And Jesus makes a way Everyone has an invitation. It is not by your work. Your work is laying your life down. The two things you're responsible for are this. Lay your life down and surrender to the king of kings. Because he's the one who cleanses and purifies you. And have that inward direction that says, I'm not stopping till I get to the Holy of Holies. And you say, I'll walk through whatever layer I have to walk through till I can get there. And that's what's going to bring the radical transformation in your life. Because you can surrender to Christ and you become a member of the camp. And you can live on the fringes of the camp your whole life saying, I'm in the camp and I feel the presence of God. And oh, is it glorious and beautiful. But you're on the fringes. And I'll say this, I invite you to come closer. Draw closer. Draw closer. It is not an easy walk. You'll have to walk through swords. Cuttings, purgings, and in their times when the Lord comes and he says, now I can consecrate you at a greater level. And all of this is for him, right? But I tell you, church, it's not about just coming. 
It's not about just saying I'm here. It's about saying I'm moving forward to know him. I'm pressing on to know him more and more and more. And that is the call of the priesthood. If our uh, <clears throat> communion teams can get ready. There's an invitation to more, right? There's an invitation to more. But I'm telling you right now, when you stop being a child and you become an adult, requirements and responsibilities increase. And if, if you're a child, the Lord's fine. He, he, will, he will deal with you and work with you and allow you to be such. But there is a call for those who want to mature and grow up that has to do with pushing forward, walking through the process, allowing the consecration to happen, allowing the purging to happen, recognizing when we've allowed to buy us in our life at some place or location. And these aren't condemnation things. If anything, I'm trying to encourage you and provoke you to say, I want to be holy. But what I really want to do is I want to raise up the priests of God to actually walk out and fulfill their duties. You know, the beautiful thing is we live in a new covenant reality, so we don't have to follow those 600 plus laws. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. Some of those laws are valid and they serve there as a point to separate you from pagan religions and to protect you from spiritual realities. When we were in Oregon, I was praying over a woman, Christian, who had uh, eaten meat sacrificed to idols in Asia or Africa. And let me tell you what, when we prayed for her to be healed because she had a stomach issue, it wasn't just a healing that happened, but there was a deliverance that happened. And she was like, that was in me? I was like, I guess so. So let me tell you that those laws, they have protective powers in your life. We don't, we don't understand that. We think it's just about doing what we're told. But the beautiful thing is, is when we come into the new covenant that Jesus is the high priest of the new covenant, a new lineage and when we come into him, we all come into his priesthood, his new priesthood. And he's there before the Lord day and night, making offerings and praying for us. He's fulfilling his role. You know, as I said, the high priest can't go to any funeral except that of his wives. But Jesus is looking for the resurrection of his wife. He's looking for the resurrection of his bride. And he's not going to come back until that is fulfilled. So as we come this morning and take our communion and give your offerings and tithes, I want to do, I've had this in my heart, I want to do like a consecration. Like essentially I want to take a registry of the people priests that are in a room that say, I'll be a priest. And we're going like the book of Nehemiah. I want that. But you understand that when you do that, there's a process, there's a cleansing, there's a sanctifying, a consecrating, any words you want to use, but it's a process of you drawing forward and it's painful. But that's the beautiful thing about having a community that surrounds you and provokes you to holiness. But this is what 2 Peter says, chapter 1, it says this. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He grant, has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. If there's anyone in here who feels a burden, a weight, and not a good weight on you, not a weight of holiness, but a weight because you feel like, I can't do that, it's not you. <laughs> it's not you, it's him. It's his divine power in you, 
Remember, your only duty is laying your life down and saying, Lord, I'm not going to stop my inward trajectory towards knowing you. And I want to read this verse in Hosea 6 again because I just can't get away from it. It says this, it says, Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. It says this in three, it says, Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. And you know, uh, when these are the verses the Lord keeps speaking to you, and it's just in His love. Like you hear that and you're like, but it's His love. As you push forward and you say, I want to know you, I want to know you, you know that all the processes in your life, the ones that you don't understand and they feel like they're crushing you, sometimes you're just getting kissed by your father <laughs> who says, who says, I want to promote you because you've been on the fringes too long. So I'm inviting you and pulling you deeper. And there might be a breaking that happens, but I swear I will heal you and bind you up. And you'll be better after than you ever were before. But it's all for him, his glory. Because I want to see the church rise up, shine his light, and manifest the glory and power of God everywhere we go. So this morning, as you have the elements... The Lord knows and recognizes every heart, but if this is what you want, you say, I want to enlist and fulfill my priestly mandate, then this morning there is a call back to service for all the priests. And if you want to do that and you're willing to go through the process and you're willing to say, cleanse me, purify me, then the first the entry door is Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. He does it for you, but you surrender. It doesn't mean it's easy. But if that's you and you say, Lord, I want to fulfill my priestly duty, whether man or woman, you're all priests. You want to fulfill your priestly duty then this morning as we take communion, let this be the covenant meal that brings you back into service as a priest. And then say, Lord, whatever unclean thing is in me, whatever unholy thing is in me, whatever impure, defiled thing is in me, Lord, I give it to you and say, break this out of me, cut this out of me if need be, but let me have that inward trajectory, that inward walk to come closer to your holy of holies, Lord. Because purity is the longing of his heart for you. So with that mindset this morning, you already in your heart have made an agreement at some level. We thank you, Father. Today you see us here. We just want to fulfill our duty as priests. We don't even know everything it looks like, Lord, but we know that you've called us to be priests. You've called us to live before you. You've called us to be your holy people set apart from the world. <laughs> Forgive us where we've let Tobiah, Lord, dwell in our midst, dwell in us. But we present ourselves to you as holy sacrifices for your service to cleanse, to pure, to consecrate, Lord. Just consecrate us, Lord, with the oil of your anointing for service unto you. We thank you, Lord, because this is just the entry door, the preparation for what you long to do in us. And we just say, any unclean thing in here, we say, get out in the name of Jesus. Any defiled thing in this house, we say, your eviction has been served. Leave now. For any Tobiah that is trying to take up residency here, we say, leave now in the name of Jesus. And we give the things that have been given to the Lord as offerings and sacrifices unto him, Lord. 
where the enemy has tried to come in and steal, we kick him out, Lord. And we take this bread as your body of being brought back into fellowship with you and everything you've done. We thank you for it, Lord. And we take this drink, the blood that you've given to give us life and bring us into that covenant. We take it now as ordained priests before you, Lord, saying that this blood right here is what makes a way. This blood right here is what cleanses us. This blood right here is what washes us. This blood is what empowers us to do what we would never be able to do within our own being and strength. And we thank you for the divine powers that's in this, Lord. We take it in your name. Now, Lord, we just submit and surrender our lives to you as priests. You have taken roll call today, Lord, and I pray for your grace over everyone here as we walk out, Lord, as we walk to know you. For those who are returning as we return to you, but for those who are drawing near and near, we walk towards you. We press on to say that, God, this is the door we get in. Or as Hosea 2 says, the valley of acre, of trouble, of crushing, but it leads to the Jerusalem, the, the Jordan Valley of bounty and plentifulness in your presence, God. We thank you. We ask for you to seal us and anoint us with your oil, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen and amen.